I think we should try to ensure and embed into people my age and our generation that the American dream is not dead and that there is possibility and there is opportunity out there. It is going to take discipline. It is going to take hard work. It is going to take education. There's going to be risk involved. But I think there is opportunity out there. This is Brandon Turner, and you are listening to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash the like and subscribe buttons. If you're listening to our podcast, go leave us a five-star review. All of our links can be found in the video description or show notes below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is a fellow Long Islander, Logan Cohn. So Logan, super excited to have you on. I know we connected over social media and talked a little bit about what you're doing. It's really quite amazing. So I'm super excited to share your story. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. Great to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, and we talked about this offline, you know, being from Long Island, you know what good pizza tastes like. So I just want to rub that in the face uh, for everybody out there. That's but true. I want to get right into it, man, and ask you the same question I ask everybody that comes on this show when we start things off. And we want to know more about you. So if you could share a little bit about your story, tell us who is Logan Cohn? Absolutely. I would say I was bitten by the uh, entrepreneur money bug pretty early. And uh, the first money I ever made was from doing magic. That was something I was always into when I was much younger. And the first few dollars I ever made was just doing street magic, performing on the street, restaurants. And then eventually I started doing gigs and went from there. I was pretty consistent. I would get a gig here and there. And I certainly liked money. That was something that was, it was really a drug. I was addicted to doing something and being rewarded for it and getting something in return, but certainly having no, no financial literacy or how to manage it or what to do with that money from such a young age, we're talking 10 to 12 years old. And then I think I got into stocks just naturally from online. So I got into the investing money world and that there's actually truly potential out there that you can actually do more than just work a nine to five or a job, go to college, the normal cycle and actually do more with your life. And I really saw what was possible just from seeing gurus and influencers online. And certainly I wanted to do the same. So the first introduction to investing, I would say was just trying to trade stocks. So I blew through many accounts, thousands of dollars that I had saved up, pretty much wiped out. And that was very frustrating. I think I wanted to make more money. So to then put into stocks, but still not having the long-term investing mindset just yet. And so I started doing online business, drop shipping, affiliate marketing, which I still do to this day. I have a few businesses. And I think it was around, I would say, probably like 17, 18 years old, I decided I want to do long term investing. So that's when I sort of started actually putting money away in a certain amount every single month and trying to build up a Roth IRA or brokerage account and really having that long term mindset. Is, and I started, I started getting into that. I had been studying real estate just on the side, watching videos, courses, hours and hours, books, anything I could find just on real estate. But that was just something in the back of my mind that I didn't think I would get into for many years down the road. But the pandemic was really the impetus. That was really the motivation to write into real estate because I took a big hit with my income, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in projected income that I'll never get back and that I lost. And I said, now's a good time. Interest rates are low. I had a ton of money saved up from long-term investing and it just felt like the right time. And now I have three properties, $1.1 million worth of real estate all in Long Island, New York, which is an impossible market for a lot of people that know the real estate market. Obviously not too impossible because you're out there killing the game, man. So first off, I just want to ask, how old are you, Logan? Turning 22 in November. So a couple months from recording this. Look at, you hear that guy? So by the time this episode comes out, he'll be 22. But right now we're talking, he's 21 years old. He owns $1.1 million in real estate, three properties on Long Island. And yes, I can tell you right now that market is bonkers. Uh, Logan, well done, man. It seems like you've really, because that, entrepreneurial bug bit you so early in life, it really helped prepare you at a very young age to get out there and start crushing it. I literally just had a conversation with somebody else earlier today. And some of the questions that I ask in my final round, I always ask, what is something that you wish you would have known when you first started? And most people say that I wish I would have started when I was younger. And that was the same answer I got today, right? Now, here we are, we got somebody that started very young, right? Now, when the pandemic first hit, you were 19, right? 
Yes. So December 19. Yeah, I was still 19. Yep. Still 19. Yeah. So 19 years old pandemic hits and you're like, I want to do real estate. I want to get into this and make it happen. And you didn't go to college, right? Nope. And you didn't have a nine to five. You were doing magic, right? So that's what you were doing. You were getting gigs and getting paid for that. Or did you wind up getting a job at first? I never had a job, never had a normal nine to five. So it's always been magic, <laughs> online business. I love it. Uh, and how YouTube is certainly part of that as well. That's right. Yeah. So you said you were doing drop shipping and also you said, uh, what was the other thing? Drop affiliate shipping, marketing, email affiliate marketing. marketing. Yep. yep. Okay. Perfect, man. Yeah. I tried my hand at drop shipping. I did okay with some of them and some of them not so much. And I wound up just giving all that up in the end, but yeah, I actually started a online, it was like outdoors, like camping gear, fishing gear. It was called the, uh, what was it called the outdoor or something like that. Yeah, I gave that up. And then I built another website that I actually wound up selling that actually turned out pretty well. And I made a profit from selling it as well. So that was pretty cool. It was about pet poop scoopers, but we won't get into all that. But that was like my taste with that piece. So I know it's hard, but it's not hard if you know what you're doing and you get yourself into it and you get into a good rhythm. So I'm glad to see that you were able to get some success there enough to get to the point where you can start investing in real estate, especially in such a tough market like Long Island, right? So if you could like, Share a little bit about how you got started in real estate specifically. Like, why was it real estate? Because I know you invested in the stock market. You lost some money there, right? And then you opened up an IRA, right? You started working on that side. But why that shift to real estate? Well, I think I realized that I can only work so much. I can only do so many things in so many hours. And I think I think the original plan before the pandemic was just to work as much as I can and just put every nickel I could possibly save into an IRA or brokerage account and maybe one day when I'm in my forties, fifties, I have seven, eight uh, figures to retire with. And that was really going to be the plan before I even got into real estate, but I have been studying it on the side. It was really something that interested me, but it was very intimidating. Even now it's so intimidating buying a house, but back then, especially when I was much younger, that was just something I didn't even think was even fathomable to actually purchase a property. I just had no idea what to do. Didn't know how to get financing. I probably thought I'd never be able to get a mortgage in my lifetime especially being self-employed, not having a normal W-2 job. And uh, I was reading books on it. So for example, I remember in school vividly, like instead of reading the English book during class, I had Art of the Deal and other rental property books that I was reading instead, but it looked the same, the pages and watching hours and hours of videos, courses. And again, the pandemic really took a toll on my income. So I realized that real estate is in fact the way to build up a consistent income pretty quickly. Granted, there's a high barrier of entry, especially in this market with the massive appreciation anywhere in the country, but let alone Long Island, there's high barrier entry, but certainly you can build up consistent income pretty quickly. And that's really what I needed because the pandemic really woke me up and saw that I truly unshakable. I could take a hit and you never know. You just never know what could happen. Even if you're all working a normal job, that job, you could be laid off tomorrow. So not, nothing certain. And I think real estate was interesting to me because a totally different kind of investment, a totally different asset class than stocks or mutual funds, index funds. And it is something that you could really build wealth. And I saw the different ways to build wealth with it, whether it's cash flow, appreciation, mortgage pay down, all that. I thought it was just right for me and I wanted to give it a try. Yeah, that's fair, Logan. So actually I want to ask you about something in particular, right? So you're very young, never had a W-2 job, working as an entrepreneur your entire life. How did you find a way to fund getting into real estate because not having that W-2 income, it is a lot more difficult as an entrepreneur to get approved for a mortgage. So what kind of challenges did you face with that? Absolutely. I had the money. That wasn't a problem. I definitely had the funds and resources. I had my peak as far as liquid money was probably a couple hundred thousand dollars in between my stock accounts, but I had no idea how I was going to qualify for a mortgage with that. So what I actually did was, is I realized I had to file my tax returns because at the time I did not know about hard money or DSCR loans that are asset-based. I wish I knew about that sooner. Um, if we're going to talk about a mistake or something that I wish I knew earlier on, that would certainly be it. But so what I actually had to do was file two years of tax returns at once, take all the penalties and hits. And obviously New York state income tax is the highest in the nation and the federal taxes and all the penalties and fees that went along with it for filing so late. So two years worth of tax returns. And now I had my tax returns, but I it's probably 40, 50 grand out that was cut off from my liquid money, but I still had a decent amount left. And those tax returns, ultimately I used to buy my first property, which was under a conventional mortgage. And that's, I went from there. Awesome. Yeah. Because after you file those tax returns, it showed like this higher income number. So that definitely helps. Yeah. For a lot of people out there, they find themselves, they decide to walk away from their nine to five, maybe a little too early. And they're like, okay, I got, I got a good gig going as an entrepreneur. They don't realize you need to have that two years of tax returns to actually make it happen to qualify for a loan. Uh, the fact that you were already doing this for a little while really helped you out 
And that makes a lot of sense when you went to go uh, make those purchases. So if you could tell, share with us, like, what was it like buying your first property? What did that first deal look like? Yeah, so that, that was definitely a new experience to me. I didn't know what I was going to do. I first thought maybe I would get something just local, very close to me down the street and just put everything I had into it because I live in a very expensive market. And then I thought maybe I would do a commercial. Maybe I'll buy a two unit storefront retail. I didn't really know what I was going to do. But then I started to understand that residential is really where it's at. And the cash flow there is definitely substantial and less risky because commercial, you never know what's going to happen with commercial space. You just don't know, especially with technology and so many businesses shutting down. And especially during the pandemic, we saw that. So I just felt that residential would be more of a safe play, especially with the pandemic. So many people flocking towards outer, out of the city into suburban areas. And I thought, okay, I'll do residential. Obviously Long Island is so expensive. So I had to look for a market in my area. That was the least expensive I could find just to accommodate what I had and what I could do. So there's an area in Suffolk County that's, I'm in Nassau County. So Suffolk County is about an hour away from me and it's called Mastic Beach, Mastic Shirley area. And it's really considered the dumpster, the armpit of Long Island. It has a very bad reputation. If you ask other investors in Long Island, they probably would never touch that area in their entire life. And so I thought, you know what though, let me take the chance. Let me see what can happen. Cause I looked at sales history and I saw that the trend is definitely up and especially with the appreciation during 2020 and 2021, I said, okay, this may not be that much of a risk. And worst case scenario is that maybe I'll just barely cover my mortgage or something or make a little bit of cash flow instead of a large amount. So at the time I bought that property, that the first one is a single family unit for $213,000. And I would do anything to get that kind of a price point back now, especially at the time I thought I was actually overpaying for the property, but now I would do anything to get that deal again. And those interest rates again. So $213,000, 20% down conventional loan. And it ended up working out very good. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know you said that area is like the uh, the armpit. Uh, have you ever been to Central Islip, where I'm from? <laughs> so Islip has a bad reputation, yeah. but they're not as bad as Mastic. But the Islip's been a lot up. It's been on the up and up for sure. No, I'm talking about Central Islip, man. There's a difference Central, between okay. Central Islip. Okay. But anyway, that's all good, man. That's what a great way to start. So you got this property at about 213. What's it worth today? Up a lot, probably up 30, 40%. Now I could easily sell it right now today, easily for 270, 280. Awesome, man. That's good stuff. Okay. So definitely you, you picked a good time to get started in real estate. I know it's a little bit crazy right now with interest rates that just hitting over 7%. You, you got in at the right time. And the thing is you had the right mindset, right? You already knew that you were going to get yourself into this. I want to point out a couple things. I know that you had mentioned like when you were going to school and stuff, you were reading a lot of real estate books. You were watching a lot of educational videos and just absorbing all of that. And I think that's one of the most important things is educating yourself and understanding what you're getting into before you actually do it. A lot of people say you know, get into it first, make the mistakes and deal with the pain afterwards. But a lot of times you could save yourself a lot of trouble and headache if you learn about it, learn what mistakes you could possibly make, learn mistakes that, that other people have made and get a good idea about that stuff before you actually get into it. You're still going to make your own mistakes and I'm sure you have, right? Everybody does, but that's the piece of real estate that we call education, right? That's self-education, self-taught when you make those kind of mistakes. I think that's huge. Now, I want to ask you, so you graduated high school, right? And you decided not to go to college and start just being an entrepreneur. So what what made that decision or how'd you come up with uh, making that decision? Like, I don't want to go to college. I want to be an entrepreneur. And then what are your thoughts on how the education system is geared right now? Yeah. So entering into high school, I thought I was absolutely going to go to college. Uh, that was definitely the plan. I didn't think anything else, but I really started to build my business in like sophomore, junior year. And I really started to see results and see some big numbers that I was really shocked by. I didn't even think it was possible. So I started really bringing in uh, quite a bit of money and trying to save and hoard as much of it as possible. I didn't really know what I was going to do with that money, but I was just saving it and being pretty financially responsible. So as far as not going to college, I just thought it would be a waste of time for me. I thought I could probably just put all this time that I would have put into more education, which I really didn't need. I didn't like school whatsoever. I thought I just put it into my business and I didn't really know exactly where I was going to be in five, 10 years from then. I didn't have an exact plan step-by-step, step, but I just knew that I'd be much better off not wasting my time with college and, and furthering education. And I thought I could just invest that time into building my business and trying to be financially free and secure. As far as my thoughts on college, I certainly I might, might have some polarizing views, but the fact is that when you look at it, millions and millions of people are in massive debt right now. And I don't even know what they're doing. I ask my friends that are in business school and I say, how much did you pay for this degree? They say it costs six figures and they don't even have a profitable business. So that's rule number one of business. Don't take out that much money unless you have, unless you have some steady cash flow. 
And when you look at it, if you look at school and the university system as designer brands, and maybe the Ivy League schools being the Louis Vuitton and the Gucci's of schools, and schools are really just a marketing ploy. Uh, it's really just a business that's profitable and it's not really churning out results. Now, is the solution to just cancel student debt and make college free? I don't know. I think you got to get down to the root cause. I don't think that's really going to solve it. I think the root cause is the education system and you really have to revamp it and frankly abolish it because it's just not working. And I think it's only going to get worse and worse. You see, as far as affordability and where we are right now with this economy, I think it's going to get worse by the generation. So millennials have it terrible. Uh, Gen Z is going to have it worse and who knows what's going to happen with the next generation. Yeah, that is definitely a polarizing view, but a very realistic view of the challenges of the way the education system is built right now. And the way it, you spend so much money to get this piece of paper saying that you're an expert in whatever where you turn around and get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and you're looking at your starting salary of like $46,000. And it's like, how do you even survive? Especially on like Long Island, you cannot survive on that kind of salary at all. It's just not even an option. Most schools have become, it's sickening, but they've all become for profit. If you look at the actual percentage of how much goes into a student's education versus how much of that money goes to just profit itself for the school, it's really sickening. Whereas my parents, they could have, first of all, they could just graduate high school and go get a job and be able to afford a house on Long Island, where if I wanted to do that, there was no freaking way that was happening, right? I was going to have to go to school, get my degree, and then hope that I can get a decent paying job. But it's even worse now. And that this was 20 years ago for me. I wound up joining the Navy and retiring from the Navy, but it's not everybody has that as an option, right? And when you think about like how much you're going to spend versus the actual return on that investment you're going to get, it's nothing really. It's peanuts. So yeah, there has to be some type of major education reform. I don't want to get into politics or anything like that, but it's something for every young person out there to consider, especially as you're graduating high school or if you're in college right now, maybe reevaluate what it is that you're doing. Is this going to really be the right path for you to follow? If financial independence is your goal, which I would hope it's everybody's goal, but at the same time, some people really enjoy their career fields that they're in, and that's great. We need that, right? Society needs that, but at the same time, there's no reason why you can't do something that you really love and still invest and make a good, healthy life for yourself and to be able to walk away from it when you want to. That's probably the most important thing. One of the things I love about what you're doing is you started off as an entrepreneur. You started off like saying, hey, I want to be financially independent. I know I want to have this freedom in my life and this is what I'm going to do to attack that and make it happen. So I think that's really awesome. And I don't see too many people your age really thinking that way. They're more worried about how many likes they're going to get on Instagram or TikTok to validate themselves socially versus trying to find themselves true happiness, right? So I really commend you for being disciplined in your goals and your aspirations because it's obviously paying off with some serious dividends here, Logan. So I think that's really awesome, man. So First of all, congratulations to you and all of your successes so far, man. This is really a treat. I appreciate that. No, thank you so much. And there's definitely a societal pressure. I think many people just go for the fact that their friends are going and they don't actually yep. know what they're doing and they're going to make the next four, in some cases, eight years of potentially time down the drain and Absolutely. the debt they're getting into and that, that financial ramification that it will have down the road. Yeah, you know, so Logan, what are your thoughts of your generation, right, Gen Z, about the current economy and why some of them are so apprehensive to think about financial literacy as a goal in life? I think, unfortunately, a lot of kids my age and millennials, a pretty large group, it is actually a large chunk of the country. I think, in fact, millennials make up the largest demographic of the nation, if I'm not mistaken. And I think a lot of them, unfortunately, have just given up and just don't see the hope. And they just say, this is just what I'm destined to do. This is just going to be my, my, I'm going to be working nine to five or whatever it is for the next 40 years. And I won't be able to ever buy a home. I'll just probably be renting for the rest of my life. And I won't really have any higher aspirations. So I think there is a level of hopelessness that I think we should try to rekindle that. I think we should try to ensure and embed into people my age and our generation that the American dream is not dead and that there is possibility and there is opportunity out there. It is going to take discipline. It is going to take hard work. It is going to take education. There's going to be risk involved. But I think there is opportunity out there. A lot of people just don't see it, unfortunately. And I think a lot of people are just surrounded by their friends that 
maybe grew up in similar situations and they don't really see a higher aspiration or have higher thought. And so I think social media though is actually doing more of a positive than a negative because it actually is exposing people to what's possible. So 50, hundred years ago, or at least any year before 20 years ago, the only people that you could really look up to are your friends, your people, your brother, your sister, your uncle, people that lived in the same neighborhood on your block. And that was really the only realm of opportunity that you really saw. But I think I, social media, as bad of a reputation it's getting, I think it's actually exposing people to what is possible. And that's only what, it done, what it's done for me. And that doesn't have to be necessarily with fitness or sorry, finance. It could be with fitness goals. It could be with taking on a new hobby. It's really, it really is doing a lot of good more than bad. I yeah, absolutely. I think that is a hundred percent true. It's the exposure that people get to the environment besides just their local surroundings that exposure that the internet itself gives somebody. But a lot of times, some people just get stuck in that mental state of this is my life. This is how I need to focus. And they don't really think outside of the box. They'll look at some of these other folks doing stuff on social media saying, oh, oh this person's investing in real estate and they're doing really well. It must be nice. I'd never be that lucky. And they don't realize that luck has nothing to do with it. Sure, you might get a really great deal and luck out on something, but man, that you don't see all the bumps and scrapes and bruises that person went through to get there. And that's the other piece about social media that kind of bothers me a little bit. There's some influencers out there that are very transparent. They'll show like, hey, here's the process and it hurts. But then there's others out here that just show their 30 seconds of, hey, look what I did here. And oh, I got this deal and this flip happened and blah, 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 blah. They didn't show that when they did the demolition they found black mold and they wound up having to cost 50,000 more to renovate that property than they originally had hoped for, right? You don't see that side. So sometimes it is a double-edged sword, but then there's a lot of other really good influences out there that say, hey, here's some of the good stuff. Here's some of the bad stuff. And that's why I like to talk about that on the podcast as well. It can't just be all rainbows and unicorns, right? Sometimes you have to see that there, there are little gremlins running around out there that you got to squash and you have to overcome and beat. And it's those people that realize that there is, there is challenges you have to overcome, right? They're the ones that break out of the mold. They're the ones that say, okay, I want to take on these challenges. I want to change my path. I don't want it to just be this straight path until I'm 60 years old and then I retire and live for a couple of years and then die with still in debt where they're like, you know what? I want to kind of go off the beaten path and see what's over here. And if I like that, cool, we'll keep going. If not, maybe try something else. So the thing is, there's so many different opportunities. It doesn't necessarily have to be real estate. You could start a business and it turns out that's something that's your niche, right? And it works out perfect for you. But you have to break out of that mold of, of quote unquote normalcy and you have to be abnormal, right? You have to break that. You have to change your mindset. That's the biggest thing, I think. And for you, you changed your mindset at a very young age and you realized, hey, I like money. I want more money. How do I get more money? And you geared your life and your career choices into how you can make more money for yourself because your ultimate goal to me from this conversation sounds like freedom right? You want to be able to do what you want, when you want, and just enjoy life. And at a very young age, here you are, man, just stepping it up. You're probably very close to your financial freedom number. If not, I know you'll be there before 30. So that's absolutely amazing, man. And then you've got your whole life ahead of you. You can go travel the world, go do whatever the hell you want, right? Keep doing magic because you enjoy it. And that's one of the things that's beautiful about it is you're giving yourself that freedom to enjoy your life and not be a slave to a job and, and just society in general. So I just, I know I'm going off on a tangent here and rambling a bit, but I think it's super important for people to understand that, dude, you're 21 years old. You're about to be 22 and this game of life, like you're doing really well, you're ahead on that board and you're winning. That's good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask you though, as you're going on now, you got three properties right now, right? So what are the plans? Let's say over the next five years for you, let's, where is Logan at the age of 26 going on 27? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, just to make one more point on the previous topic, and that's sure. okay. For Absolutely. Sure. So I think part of the problem also is that, especially with my generation and millennials, is that there is a semblance of tall poppy syndrome and this uh, vilification of the rich and the wealthy. And I think it's a big problem that I don't think we've ever seen it as widespread as we're seeing it right now now with my generation. I think there's an absolute sentiment that money is evil and that anyone that has it is despicable and uh, deplorable. And so I think that is part of the problem. And people just look at money as something now that 
if you hoard it, you're evil, whereas it's really totally the opposite. And so I think if we also change that mindset, I think that would also start a, a lot of people starting into the investing, having that long-term mindset and then changing their views on money. I think it is happening with the democratization of investing. I think it's more accessible than ever. You can just open up the Robinhood app right on your phone. And certainly there is a vilification there. And I think we're seeing it more than ever with my generation. But again, on social media though, I think it is a net positive, even though people might not show everything, even though you just see the highlight reel and you see the sound bites and the clips, I think even just flashing at Lamborghini for 30 seconds online, is totally okay. I think it really is a net positive. And if that's what it takes to get, wake someone up or change their mindset, I think that's all right. But yep. So as far as my five-year goal. Yeah. Where are you at the coming on to the age of 27? So I think just doing what I'm doing right now, but at scale. So hopefully growing my YouTube channel, growing that audience, building my brand more and obviously acquiring more properties and renting and repeating. I think I am going to get into apartment buildings and on larger complexes down the road, do some 1031 exchanges there and start actually scaling my portfolio from single and duplexes to a much larger complexes. That will something that is something that will definitely be down the road, perhaps also doing other markets, maybe going out of Long Island. But for me, it's tough because I don't even drive. So I'm pretty limited and constricted to where I am and perhaps getting into other business ventures and investing and maybe taking on other projects, writing a book, who knows, we will see what happens. I don't have every, every little step planned out, but that's, what's great about life. Some of it is unpredictable. Yeah, absolutely, man. I love that. I love that. And I love how you, uh, you talk about how you're restricted to where you're at right now, but you're still thinking bigger about how can I look to outside of Long Island, look at different areas that I can do this. First step would probably be getting your license, right? That's great, man. Look, dude, you, you don't have a driver's license, right? Nope. No permit, nothing. So no permit, no driver's license. And look at what you're freaking doing right now. It's insane. Yeah, dude, that's awesome, man. Just again, kudos, man. I want to transition this into something that we call the uh, final round. I'm going to ask you the same four questions that I ask everybody that comes on this show. Some of them, I think I already know the answer to, because we've already alluded to it, but I just want to dig down deeper on that. So if you're ready to go, we'll get this party started. I think so. All right, Logan. Awesome. So actually this first one, I'm going to ask you this for two different sections because, because of the way you started things off as an entrepreneur. So What's the biggest mistake you've ever made in business? And what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in real estate? So I think as far as business, I don't think I could have started earlier. Real estate, I always regret if I just started just a couple of years, even just one year before, I would have oh, seen come massive on. You're, appreciation. You're killing me with that. <laughs> I know. It's tough. But if I just started just months or one year before, I could have gotten much better value and much more appreciation to where I am now. But that's all right. That's perfectly okay. As far as business, I definitely made mistakes with trying out different ways of marketing and wasting money on advertising, whether it was social media or Google ads, things like that. But that's all part of the game. I don't think I've ever had too much of a devastating blow where I would say I truly regretted that. Even the pandemic, which obviously caused so much hardship and pain for so many people, and myself included, I think it was all part of the lesson. And I really don't think I would be where I am today if it wasn't for the pandemic. I really think it, it actually did help me a lot and I gained a lot of wisdom from it. So I truly do not have too many regrets. Obviously I could have sold a stock later or earlier. I could have bought into a stock here and there, bought this cryptocurrency, but all that is behind me and we're just on our own paths and I can't compare my chapter one to someone else's chapter two. hundred percent. Oh man, I love that. And one of the biggest things that you just mentioned there too, that it was the lessons that you learned while doing this. It's one of the beautiful things that we can take what we call quote unquote mistakes and say, yeah, it was a mistake, but it was also a very educational piece of who I am today. And I learned from it. It's something I won't do again, because I know that if I do A, B, C, or D, this is going to happen. This will be the result. Absolutely love that, Logan. So I appreciate that. All right. So I know it, it hasn't been that long ago since you started, but this next question is, what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? So I would say definitely looking into other types of financing and exploring your options. Uh, obviously there's many notions I've already dispelled that you can't buy a property for self-employed. That's not true. You can't buy a property in New York. That's not true. And you need this, that, the other thing, but obviously I've pretty much done it all and dispelled all those notions as far as mistakes or as far as which, what I wish I knew earlier. So yeah, definitely knowing about other types of financing, not just knowing about the conventional Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgage and knowing there's actually other types of financing out there. And not to be afraid of it. That was not necessarily something taboo. People do it all day long. And so I wish I knew about that earlier. So I did use a DSCR loan on my second property and I'll probably be doing it. Conventional is my third one. The next property will be a DSCR loan though. And then also that there's other types of do, other ways to do real estate, but not necessarily just buying and holding. Perhaps if I wanted to, I probably could have done a flip earlier on because I had enough money in reserves to do. Could have made a, a nice profit and cashed out. Probably would have known about HELOCs and taking out your equity and then using that towards other properties. If I knew that earlier on too, that certainly could have made a difference. 
But uh, overall, I've gained so much knowledge and experience. And you know, one of the big things is that you can read all the books, you can watch all the videos, you can watch all the courses, but you won't actually know until you do it. And so it's all about the execution. And obviously going in, I had so many looming questions and fears above my head that I just didn't know the answer to. But once you actually do it and get your feet wet and actually dive right in, I think the process will be a lot smoother and easier for you. Yeah, man, that that is perfect answer to that question. In just a short period, the stuff that you've learned and now, just two years later, the tools that you have in your tool belt now have expanded so much that I could put Batman to shame with that utility belt. You know what I'm saying? So you've got everything you need. You know what you need to do. Now you know about these programs that you wish you would have known about, but now you know how to tap into that. You know how to tap into your equity of your properties to acquire more assets. And that's absolutely awesome, man. Um, so definitely appreciate your transparency there and sharing that with us. Now, do you have, Logan, uh, this is the third question of it. Do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started today? Yeah. So especially for kids my age that, that are probably graduating college or probably already have a steady job, whether it's uh, just their entry-level position or some of they're going to build up to or whatever it is, they have nine to five. So they actually have income on paper. So that's good. Obviously building a credit is huge. So if you haven't already, obviously start building a credit. I opened up my first credit card. A secured credit card shortly after I turned 18. So that's huge. You definitely need credit. It's really hard to do anything without it. So if you have that income on paper and you have a steady nine to five, that's great. So we'll try to utilize that. And so definitely try to do an FHA, try to house hack, and maybe try to look into a duplex or a three family in your area close to you. It doesn't have to be in another state and try to put as much down as you possibly can, but you could with an FHA loan, put as little as three and a half percent, five percent down. And you'll be able to use the projected income from the other rental units towards the debt to income ratio, as well as your W-2 job. So especially for someone that may not have a lot of money, but they have a job, that is definitely an option for you. And it's something that I would definitely look into. Yeah, perfect. Hey, there you guys go. If you're just getting started out, look at what Logan did just, just a few years ago and where he's at today. This is a perfect example of that's taking the odds that are stacked against them and using it to his advantage, right? So people that have a lot of those limiting beliefs, like you had mentioned earlier with the last question about you're dispelling a couple of them, like I can invest on Long Island. Hey, I can invest at this young age. Hey, I can invest without a W-2 job, without that income, right? And you're proving all of these things that people would normally use as an excuse. You're proving that wrong. You're dispelling all of that. I think that's absolutely fantastic, man, because I think it's important for people to hear this, especially young people your age and in Gen Z, you still have so much ahead of you. There's so much that you could do right now in your 20s to really set yourself up that you could live an enjoyable life in your late 20s, early 30s, and just, just chill out and live that financial freedom life. Dude, I love this, man. This conversation has been fantastic. I have one more question for you for the final round, and that's going to be, and I'll, I'm going to say this besides your own, because I know you have a YouTube channel. We'll talk about that in a second, but do you have a favorite business investing or real estate related book or podcast or both? Yeah. So definitely a big fan of bigger pockets. There's tons and tons of information on there. Obviously I'm a big Grant Cardone guy. So I love Grant Cardone. I love watching him and listening to him and what he has to say. Now granted what you're able to do now may not line up with his specific, what he preaches his dogma, but that's okay. You can always take golden nuggets and these little pieces of information from anyone and everyone. So I like bigger pockets like Grant Cardone and there's so many books out there on rental property and investing that it's truly limitless. And to add on the last one as well is the big thing is just reaching out. We're so connected now. We have so many resources at our fingertips. Our phones are more powerful than a rocket ship, scientific fact. And so join the Facebook groups. Maybe there's local meetups and groups in your area. Reach out to people on social media that are in your position and are in your shoes and learn from them and try to learn from people that are already doing what you want to do and try to avoid some of those mistakes. I try to take some shortcuts and I not necessarily try to get rich quick overnight, but learning from other people's experience and their mistakes. And it's just so helpful. And you could be paralyzed with all the information, knowledge. It's definitely information overload in this digital age, but to take what you can. And it's all about the execution. Again, you won't really know until you actually do it. Yeah. Oh, I love that, man. Hey, bigger Pockets has been such a big part of my investing as well. It's one of the things that's inspired me probably more than anything else out there was the Bigger Pockets podcast. So I'm glad that you brought that up as well. But also to touch on the other things you were saying, it is very important to get out there and meet people and not only educate yourself, but network with others find like-minded people, find your tribe, right? Find your tribe and fully invest yourself in that. Because when you surround yourself with people doing what you want to do, you're eventually going to do it, right? You're going to get yourself into it. If you hang out in a room of five millionaires, right? And you're hanging out with them all the time, you're going to be the sixth one. So it's very important that you insert yourself into that, into those groups, into those situations, ask questions, build relationships, and just get out there and crush it, man. So I definitely appreciate that. Now, 
I have one more question for you, Logan. That's it for the okay. final round. But this question is the most important question of all because the people you know, that, that are sitting here listening to this episode are like, man, this guy is 21 years old. He's doing this. He's doing that. Absolutely amazing stuff as an entrepreneur at such a young age. And I want to know more about him. I want to know. So I know he has a YouTube channel. So what's that? How can I find it? So do you have a website, social media, or anything like that you could share with us and uh, get these listeners pumped up? Yep. So I have YouTube. So that's just my name, Logan Cohn. And then on Instagram as well, Logan Cohn. And then I take all my videos from YouTube and I post them to Facebook. And I also post some short clips as well on TikTok. So I'm really all over the place. We talk about everything from business to real estate, to investing, to politics and, and news. So I really try to cover it. All right. Fantastic. It's like a one-stop shop over there with Logan's. Go check out his stuff. I'm going to get his links and put them in the show notes for you guys. Make it easy for you. Go check out his YouTube channel. Check him out on social media. And if you are going to go click on those links, go ahead and click them or copy and paste and get into it. Just don't do it while you're driving folks. But Hey, I, Logan, I really appreciate this, man. This conversation was awesome. What you're doing is awesome. I wish you continued success. And I will be following your adventures as you, you continue on your path, reaching financial freedom and just crushing it in life, man. So well done. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. It was great to be on. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, to my listeners, thank you so much for joining me and our special guest, Logan Cohn on the Average Joe Finances podcast. Go leave us a five-star review and tell us what you liked about today's episode with Logan. Aloha from Hawaii and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. 